We are live. It Yay! Has <laughs> and speaking I, of live. Yeah, speaking of live, we are live on Facebook in the group, Producing Influential Leaders of Tomorrow. And I'm excited are, to- Speaking oh, of live, we, go. This we happens. are live. That's the problem. <laughs> Uh, I've got a I've seen that in a bunch of your videos. Facebook. I know it drives me nuts and it there's nothing I can do about it. I sit there and wait and it always it always beats me. Uh, <laughs> but I'm very happy to introduce Paul Stryer, who is our guest today. And um, you know, we had an interesting conversation just prior to this talking about, you know, the the different ways we communicate as entrepreneurs, whether it's live in person, whether it's live on video like we are today, or whether it's on video for courses. And so we're going to be touching on that today, which I think is exciting. Well, I find it exciting being a um, <laughs> We're nerds, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I think it's an important thing for all entrepreneurs to, to really grasp the concept of the similarities and the differences in all those different arenas and how we present. But before we jump into that, Paul, tell us about you and your business and what you do, uh, because just, uh, you know, our, our brief conversation was interesting because you've got kind of got your toe in a bunch of pools. Oh, I do. I do. Too many, too many pools sometimes. Um, <laughs> being spread too thin is not a good thing. Um, and I'm starting to learn to use virtual assistants, which is amazing. So it's really helping out quite a bit. But well, I'm, I'm Paul Stryer and uh, um, I've been in the uh, technical industry doing network engineering for about 30 years. And most of that 30 years, I've been doing training along with my engineering because it's just what I gravitate towards. And, and it really is how I learn something. They have, you always hear that saying, the people that can't do teach. Well. That's not true because I learn more about a subject when I teach it than when I don't teach it. So, you know, yeah, I, I do it plus I teach it and, yeah. and I wouldn't and I wouldn't do something unless I teach it. But I've been teaching for about 30 years. Uh, I am a father and I'm recently empty nest and I'm single. So, you know, I don't know what my next chapter is going to be, but my entire work is on the Internet. So I'm probably going to become digital nomad here as soon as my daughter goes off to school next month. And so we'll see what happens and where I'm going to be coming from and what I'll be doing. Um, well, you do a lot of traveling. Already. Yeah, I do a lot of traveling with work, but I do a lot of traveling at work, but in the last year and a half, obviously I haven't done really any for work. I've done <laughs> private travel, but, um, but I wasn't scared of COVID. So I was traveling and having fun and doing stuff anyways. So, but, so I've, you know, I've been, Working uh, as a network engineer for years, I've worked at big companies such as Levi Strauss. I've worked at The Gap. I've worked at a bunch of companies as in the IT department. And around 1997 or 24 years ago, I started working for Cisco and became a network engineer instead of an IT person. And during that time, I've created or developed thousands of classes for Cisco and, and for other companies and my own projects as well. Um, but I've created lots of classes. So I've learned a lot about how, what the psychology is that goes into building a course. Cause you don't just slap a course together. It is a well thought out plan if you do it right, because yeah. you gotta know, I gotta teach X before I teach Y. Otherwise it doesn't make sense. You have to know how things work. And as you start teaching, like I'm teaching a brand new class that I just finished for Cisco a couple of weeks ago, and I've been teaching it. And I'm like, man, my thoughts on what I was thinking of teaching just didn't turn out right. So now I'm shifting things around. So you got to really understand the psychology behind how people learn and what the relationship is with the learning. That's so, a really valid point. And I, I was a teacher for 17 years. And so when I do people's courses and I, I take things, I think of those things mm -hmm. as well. Like I, I did a Tony Robbins course. Mm -hmm. uh, I did a Knowledge Broker Blueprint that he and Dean Graziosi created. And I mean, it's a great course, but all I kept thinking of is I need to show them how to scaffold and I need to show them. <laughs> I do the same thing. I also, when I'm watching teachers teach, I'm critiquing them even without I'm knowing I'm critiquing them. You know, I'm like, oh, well, he could have said this better. He could have done that. Or if he'd went this way to get there, it would have been much better for the students. And 
Exactly. Because you know, nobody over here understands. And if he had just done this, they would have understood, you know. But it's easy when you're not in the hot seat. Well, we are in the hot seat today. Yeah. <laughs> you're not in the hot seat. It's easy to see what someone could have done better, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah. I'm That's always doing that. Have other eyes on things that you're doing yes. as well, yes. because yes. it might make sense to you in your brain because you know the material. But yes. when you have somebody who does it and go, well, wait a minute, there's a big hole here. I don't understand how it goes from A to B. Then yeah. you go, oh, I totally forgot because yeah. I and know Bean, ta so Bean talks about that a lot too, going through the valley to get to where you're going instead of taking the bridge over. He talks a lot about that. I call them rabbit holes. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there's obviously ways around the rabbit holes that make it much more sense. And that just comes with experience and learning, right? And I, I spent lots of years watching other teachers because I travel with a lot of other teachers. And I pick up the things I like that they do. And I pick up the that And I make sure that I put that in my head and separate them and say, okay, don't do this, but do this and add more to what he did. Because, you know, having mentors for anything is really important. Agreed. Um, yep. hundred so, percent. So back to, back to my quick intro of me. So I've been building courses forever and I've designed dozens and dozens and dozens for Cisco and for other companies and, and for, uh, and for my own personal projects. And last year I finally decided, you know what, let's just take this out on the road, <laughs> so to speak. And let's start pulling ourselves out of Cisco and corporate America and put yourself into yourself full time. So that when the kids leave, you can be a full digital nomad for yourself. Even though I can still do it for Cisco, I want to do it for myself. So that's when I started Digital Course Warriors last last year. And so far, it's going really well. We have, uh, you know, a couple of courses there. I have uh, the main flagship uh, course, which is the Digital Course Warriors Blueprint. And that's basically a class that teaches you how to build online courses and coaching programs. And because uh, I think it should be a hybrid. I don't think that a course should just be a course, you know unless it's a very low ticket course, kind of a lead magnet to get you to the bigger course, which yeah. we'll talk about in a minute, which we were just talking about my financial fitness workshop that I'm working on. Yeah. Um, but mainly, you know, I think they should all be coaching and on-demand courses. And that's a better way to get yourself to that higher ticket price anyways. If you just throw out a bunch of videos out there, it might only be worth a hundred dollars, but if you add coaching and some other things on top of it, you might get a thousand bucks out of a course and people feel great about it because you're bringing them massive value and yeah. you have to do massive value. If you're not going to bring the value, you might as well just stay home. Um, yeah. Yeah. You got to be willing to, to step up and I'm always working with my students. I mean, even though I have a, a, a item on my website that they can buy to buy one-on-one -on -one time with me, most of the time they'll just message me in Facebook because they already have that anyways, my address. And I help them anyways, you know, here, just try this, try that, you know, and a lot of times I know the answer really quick off the top of my head and they just find that massive value because you're there, you know, even though they're supposed to wait till the weekly one on one to many, you know, or, you know, they're supposed to wait until the right time. I still answer them all the time anyways. And you got to be careful with that though, because you can get yourself to the point where you're overwhelmed. And you don't have enough time to do anything. So as you get more and more students, you got to kind of push back on that. When you start out, you, you have a little more time. Yeah. Um, and that all goes into the planning of what we talk about in my course is, you know, it's not just here's how to build a video and how to put it up on the internet. It's here's the psychology behind building courses. Here's how to handle your students because they're going to take advantage of you if you let them. And, uh, you know, you have to know when to put your foot down and say, you know what, enough's enough, you know. Yep. I've answered 15 questions for you today. I've spent the whole day talking to you and, you know, you haven't paid me anything. You know, it's, it's not really about getting paid, but at some point you have to say, you know what, you need to go buy a one-on-one -on -one because, yeah. you know, well, your time is yeah. And, but in the beginning you want to give as much and everybody, everybody does that. And then once they start feeling like, you know, enough's enough, that's when they start putting their foot down and, and learning how to do it gently and how yeah. to do it properly. But, you know, you don't say get the heck out of here, right? <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, so we do a lot in my class. It's not just, it's not just, here's my, you know, I don't just give you some videos and here it goes. I'm actually getting ready to offer a, what I'm calling a DIY version of my course, which will be a lower cost version where it is just the on-demand videos. And then they can buy one-on-one -on -one time on me as needed. Um, so they can buy it for a cheaper price. I'm getting ready to add that to my website here this week, um, just to offer a lower ticket item so people can get started. Um, yes. But I find that people that do self-serve like that tend to either not do the class or not finish the class or finish their course and coaching program. And if they have that 
accountability of having the higher ticket item where they are, um, where they're, you know, getting my time and they're getting the one to many time. And the one to many time, people think, oh, that's, you know, I'd rather have one to one time. But you know what? The one to many time that I do with my students is way more positive than the one to one. I mean, yeah, one to one is important, but the one to many, you get so much more out of it. Because if I get 20, because we do it once a week, you know, my students, we get together once a week and do one to many, and they answer all, ask all their questions. Well, yeah. If you have 20 people in there and one person asks a question, well, 19 other people heard the question and the answer, so exactly. they learn from it. And, and then they all start asking questions about that and we get even more value out of it. So we're getting massive value out of that. But the accountability factor in those meetings is what really stands out because you know I take notes in those meetings and I write down people's names and what they say they're gonna do next week. And when they come back next Sunday, I'm saying, hey, did you do that? And they're like, uh, how did you remember that? And no, I didn't. <laughs> Yes. And then we embarrass you and then, you know, we embarrass you a little bit. And, uh, and then we go about our way and, and, and it makes people like, oh man, I better get that done before Sunday or Paul's going to be disappointed, right? And the rest of the 20 people or, or 30 or 40, you know, and they're different yeah. people every week as well, because some people come and then they'll wait a couple weeks and come, you know, they don't all come every week. Yeah, that's a good point. Because also, I think part of that accountability is you know, hearing what other people are doing or where they're at. And I, I know we shouldn't compare ourselves, but we do. And yeah. so somebody's like, so I've got this and this and this done. And you're, you're like, uh oh, <laughs> I, I'm a little behind. Yeah. And it gives you that kick in the ass to yeah. sort of get things done so that you're not left behind yeah. because everybody else is moving forward. Yeah. And you're right. When, when you've got 20 people in a class and one person asks a question, it could be so valuable because it may be a question you hadn't thought of, yep. but you needed to know the answer to. Yeah. So, you know, I, I find one-on-one -on -one is great as well. And some people yep. need that handholding, yep. but there is so much value in group uh, yep. because yeah, of it, it's amazing. Scary. It's amazing what happens in the group. It's just this synergy. Yeah. It's just, you know, and this, the, the energy that's in the room is really amazing because people get really excited about it and, and, you know, it's, it really is, it's kind of like a Tony Robbins kind of thing, right? It's like, yeah. you get in there and, you know, and, you know, I've been in some groups where people just sit there and they talk and they're like, you know, you know, and it's not exciting, but I, you know, you get in there with open energy and everybody else gets the energy and it just takes off. And when, and my favorite, I guess what keeps me teaching, my favorite part of teaching is watching the light bulbs go on. Yes. When I see someone's light bulb go on and they get it and you know, they got it and this, and that's why I like teaching live in a room, not live on the internet, but live in a room. I can see you now, but when there's 20 people, it's hard, you know, you don't end up seeing somebody when the light bulb goes on. But when I'm in a classroom of 20 people and I got 20 engineers in front of me and I see this one guy struggling all week. And then all of a sudden on Wednesday, you just see him go, oh, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, and you know what's funny? We were talking about this before we went live today. I said, you know, a lot of people say, oh, people that teach are people that, you know, can't do it you know, people that can't do teach, right? Well, that's not true. I feel that if I can't do it, I'm not going to teach it, one. And so everything that's in my course is, you know, things I've done millions of times. And, uh, and I know they work. And the items I pedal, such as affiliate items, I won't pedal them unless I use them myself all the yeah. time. You know, if it's a product I love, I'll become an affiliate and sell it. But what I was getting to say is they say, people that can't do teach. Well, it's not true. I know a lot of teachers out there that are incredible engineers that are teaching, but I have to say more light bulbs have gone on for me while I was teaching than while I was doing a lot because I can do the, I know the steps to do whatever it is I'm doing in the network or whatever I'm doing just to get it done. But you never really understand how it works or what's going on. All of a sudden I'll be sitting there writing on the whiteboard and teaching and all of a sudden it'll go, oh my God, I've been teaching this for five years. I didn't know what was going on in the background, but now I do, man, that makes sense. I've even had light bulb minutes, light bulb moments in front of 20, 30 people where I say, you know what, it's break time, yeah. get out of here. And they'll all leave the room and I'll sit there and diagram it out on the board because I wanna make sure that it sinks in what I just learned while, yeah. while what came to me. And I, it happens all the time. So yeah. I say teaching is the best way to learn a subject. And Absolutely. so- you know, all the people that I teach, they say that too. They say, you know, I thought I knew my subject well, but once I started creating the videos or teaching it, that's when I really got to know it. Yeah. 
And I find, I mean, I, I taught kids, but even, even teaching young people, I still say I learned as much, if not more from doing that from them yeah. than they probably ever learned from me. Yeah. Right. Cause it's not just about the course material. There's so much else that you learn yeah. as you teach, you learn to communicate, you learn to be concise, you learn how to put information together so that it is absorbed or it is, yes. you know, easily digested. And also, I mean, part of what I do being a voice specialist is I teach people how to get that engagement and how to keep their audience engaged Absolutely. and get little tricks and tips and things that help keep that audience on that ebb and flow that you are doing and you're presenting. And yeah. people don't think that there's an art to it, but it is. Absolutely and so is. we learn it by doing it. And we yeah. learn it by like, we can talk about it for days, but yeah. until you step up and do it, you don't fully understand the impact that it can have on people until you're teaching it. That's how I used That's to study actually. Yeah, is me too. I was teaching the course material, yep. um, you know, for, for subjects, especially that were not my favorite. And I had yeah. to, you yeah. know, well, as, we're, as we're talking about before we came on, I said, I like to watch other teachers, you know, teach and find out what I like about their style and what I don't like about their style. And I incorporate what I like about it into my own teaching, but also when you're watching someone teach and they're teaching, you can see everybody in the room's confused. And they're just not hitting the right notes, so to speak. And you're like, well, if you had just went around this way, if you just went around this other way and taught it like this, and it makes you just want to jump up and say, hey, wait a minute, let me show you how to do this. And, you know, you want to just jump up and say, here, say it like this, and they'll get it. And, and I've done that a couple of times with teachers. You know, I'll raise my hand and say, well, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I'll ask, I'll make it like I'm asking a question or making a statement, but I'm actually teaching the rest of the people in the room. It's a, it's a occupational hazard. I do it everywhere I go. I yeah. always end up teaching every class like I'll go to meetups all the time to learn stuff and I end up teaching the whole thing it, yeah. it happens to me almost every meetup I go to I'll be sitting in the room with all those people wanting to learn this subject or more about it and I end up teaching the whole class because I know more than the teacher <laughs> it's it's kind of sucks and uh, <laughs> and then they invite me back to teach popular. their next class so it, it's an occupational hazard yes <laughs> I, I try not to embarrass anybody, so I try to make it like a statement, right? It's like, well, blah, what about blah, blah, blah? And then I'm hopefully teaching the people to get them, un, you know, to, to get them unstuck where they're at. So I've had I, teachers I come to me after the class and say, thank me. It's like, you know, thank you so much for making that statement because it helped everybody understand what I was trying to say. Right. So. Oh, my phone is about to go off. Um, now, we had talked prior as well about sort of addressing the differences in, you know, speaking events and, and teaching or, you know, whatever, we're sort of coming out of this pandemic, things are starting to happen in person again. And we're now so used to doing things online. <laughs> we're now so used to doing things online. We're like, oh, geez, you know, I, I've actually got to put real clothes on, not just a nice <laughs> job. And I have... Go I got my swimsuit on under this. I'm going to the pool right after this. Nice. Awesome. <laughs> um, we're, we now have to sort of shift our mindset back to the reality of doing live events, doing, yeah. you know, and I mean, online is still a possibility and I love it because it brings people from, you know, all over the world together yeah. in one spot. And then of course we talked about also people creating courses, which is what you teach people to do and what that looks on video. So mm -hmm. I, I think it's a great topic to sort of touch on mm -hmm. the differences and yet the similarities of things to focus on when you're speaking live and when you're doing a live event versus an online yeah. Zoom kind of thing like this or video. Mm -hmm. And then of course, how you do the videos for your courses. Yeah. So, so it's funny. Something, something just came to mind when you were talking about that. You remember, 
Remember back in the, I don't know, maybe the late 70s when Saturday, uh, Saturday Night Live and Steve Martin, no, no, it wasn't even Saturday Night Live. Steve Martin came on to the Johnny Carson show to host it one night and he came out with his full suit on top and underwear. Remember that? And and then the guy with the cleaner, the guy from the cleaners comes in and hands him his pants, you know, and it's in the wrapper at the cleaning. Oh. You, know, he, you know, he's out there doing the monologue in his underwear with a, you know, suit and tie on top and underwear on the bottom and socks on. And he's out there doing the monologue, Steve Martin. And uh, and then the guy comes out and taps him on the shoulder. And it's like, you know, he's dressed up in a little uniform like he works for the laundry service. And he hands him his clothes. It just kind of reminds me of that, you know, being prepared to go teach live, right? <laughs> so, yeah. so in my career, like I said, I've been teaching since the early 90s. And, um, you know, I was teaching with Lockheed. I was teaching at Levi's at Providium Bank Corps the gap i was doing all kinds of stuff um and i prefer being in a room full of people you put me in front of a room of a thousand people and i'm in my happy place yeah. and i'll teach any subject you give me a subject five minutes before we go on stage you can say talk about nursing i will go out there and talk about nursing and they will think that i've been a nurse for 20 years i just I, i've got this knack for doing it and that's because of what cisco did to me um because they were always making me teach classes that I had never seen before. And I had about a 20 hour head start on studying before I went in and taught a class. I would teach a class on security for five days and I don't do security, that's not my expertise. I don't know security. I know enough to be really bad at it. <laughs> and they'd give me a class and I'd go teach it. And these people paid a lot of money to come see an expert and I'm like 20 hours ahead of them. And uh, yeah. so it's, uh, it's but live, I, lo I love, I'd much rather be in a room full of people because yeah. I like being able to see the faces. I can tell who's getting it. I can tell who's not getting it. And I started teaching online about 2005. So when everybody was freaking out last year to try to figure out how to do their job online, my job has been online since about 2005. So I'd already been doing it for 15 years. So, yeah. um, so I've been doing a mix of online classes and live classes since then. And yeah. I've traveled the world, taught all over the world for, you know, from you know, all over Europe, all over America, South America. I've been pretty much everywhere teaching live for Cisco. And, uh, and being prepared, I mean, there is obviously a big, huge difference in going live in person and going live like we're doing right now in the internet. Um, you can kind of hide behind the computer here. People can't you know, get, have that gotcha moment because right now nobody's asking questions. And we haven't set this particular class up to have hands raised up so they can talk. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if there's a chat room going. Maybe so. I don't. I don't know. I don't. I don't know that. But uh, um, sometimes there's there's chatting. Yeah. So, so if he's on, just you know, shoot us a message. Yep. Yeah. So there's there's a lot of differences. Like when you go live, you're in the room with the people, so you've got to deal with people in person live. Yeah. When you're live on the internet, you don't have to deal with them as much live but you have to deal with the technology while you're trying to teach and while you're trying to present or whatever it is you're doing so if you're if if you don't have the luxury like i normally do when i do my lives at cisco um i usually have a moderator that runs all the equipment and i just have to talk and that's it um so uh you know the lives that i've done have all been with other people helping me so that's um, awesome <laughs> yeah and then when you do your your videos that's a whole different thing because the videos that you're doing for your online course that, um, you know, you can take your time and get it right. And if you watch all my videos, there's no, uh, and uh, um, even though they were recorded, I've edited them all out. So they're all out. So everybody's always asked me, how do you make your videos so smooth? There's never any pauses. There's no, I was like, dude, it's editing, you know, it's, you know, you know, and it takes a long time to edit. I mean, um, basically, I've got, I've done so many thousands of videos now that it's roughly down to every 10 minutes of video footage takes an hour of editing. Yeah. So if I want to do a 10 minute video, it's usually about an hour of editing and then however long it took me to record it, maybe another hour to record. So two hours of time to make a, you know, a 10 minute video. I have videos that took me, you know, 24 or 30 hours to do and it's a, you know, 15 minute video, you know, it's, it's, you know, and I've, um, and the reason why I love doing video so much is my actual college degree is in audio video engineering. So, oh, okay. so I've done a lot of videos in the eighties of hair bands and I have a lot of videos that were actually on MTV. 
that I produced. So okay. um, I was just going to say that's that's where people need to understand why it costs millions and millions of dollars yeah. to do a film. Yep. And, and yeah, they pay the actors. Yeah, they pay the crew and all those things. But so much time is spent after the movie is shot. Yeah, editing editing yeah. and sound and all those things that get added in and mixed together so and it's the same it's the same thing with recording an album right yeah you know when i owned my recording studio i'd get calls from you know people that had never recorded before you know some old guy called and say hey i got this song i want to record um how much is that going to cost me and i said well how long you know you know how long is the song and and you know and they'd be you know and then like well our our cost or actually i'd say our cost for the studio time is 225 an hour and he goes well the song's only two minutes so what is that about 20 bucks so i'm like, <laughs> I'm like wait a minute dude you obviously don't understand you know you know i you know and so you have to explain to them what it takes to record or you know the way they really record and so i invited the guy down to say hey why don't you watch how we record an album and then we'll talk about doing your album right and then yeah. so he came and watched and he was just blown away because he's like dude i had no clue you know, I just thought you got in there, you ran through it once, you hit the, you know, here's your cassette, Get right? You know? <laughs> and I've done that, I've done that before. I've done, because uh, my recording studio was a mobile recording studio. So I did a lot of live shows and I would go in and do a 60 piece orchestra and have two microphones up and you could hear every little, you could hear a mouse walking on the floor. Um, and it sounded great. And you just push record when they're done, you're done, right? And, uh, yeah. you know, but that's not usually the case. Yeah. You know, when you, when you create these videos, um, and if you go to my, my Facebook page and you see all these videos of me talking and doing inspirational pieces or whatever, most of those are edited after the fact, even though I try not to say and and um and delay and sit there and think while I'm talking, it's not that easy. You know, you gotta, you know, I'm walking through the park recording a video and, you know, something goes by, you look at it, right? Or, you know, or, you know, you drop something or someone falls over on their bike, you know, and. Yeah. You know, that happens right in the middle of recording videos. That's, I was right. talking about what you were talking about. Things happen while you're recording or going live. Always. So, you know, when you're doing videos, you have the luxury of time, right? You can take your time. You can make it right. You can edit out anything you want to edit out. When you're live, you don't have that luxury. Like you were talking about, your nose started bleeding on one of your videos. While right. you were doing a live, you just took a Kleenex and kept on going, right? Um, yeah. So there is a very big distinction and the psychology behind every one of those three is a lot different. You have to prepare yourself mentally differently. Like when I go to do a, a, a video to put post, when I have a topic I want to talk about, I'll go to the park or I'll go to some parking garage up on the top or wherever I want to have it. And, and you got to get mentally prepared for that and kind of have an idea. I, know, I don't usually do scripts. I just kind of have an idea what I want to talk about and go. But a lot of times I used to always have scripts. I, even on my phone, I have a teleprompter on my phone. So while I'm recording on my phone, it sits there and does words, but you can tell when I'm reading, you know, I can't, I'm not that good at it. Yeah. Uh, when I, so I, when I, I stop I, that. Yeah, yeah, I find, yeah, you can tell for the yeah. most part. And, and when I coach people, I say, everybody has a different style. So it's really mm -hmm. up to you. Some people, it's a security blanket. They feel better having a script yep. in front of them that they follow. Other people like having notes because they, you know, they follow the notes, but they're yep. still sort of freely mm -hmm. just speaking. And then some people wing it, start to mm -hmm. finish, and they just, they're comfortable doing that. So really there's no right or wrong. It's whatever works for that person. But the point is, is keep practicing because you'll get yep. better no matter what it is that you choose. Yeah, yeah you just the more redundancy, right? Consistency and redundancy just keeps, you know, you know, what does Tony say? Uh, repetition is the mother of all skills, right? So yeah. um, Most definitely. So, um, you know, it, it, and like I said, it's the psychology, you know, you got to pump yourself up for whichever one you get ready to go do it. You know, when I'm, when I'm getting ready to go do a live in person one, you know, as soon as I walk in the room, I start shaking hands and meeting people and trying to remember names. I write them down a lot of times or whatever, but you know, I have a whole different way of dealing with a live in person than I do when I'm live on the internet or yeah. when I'm creating videos. And yeah. when you see videos that I do that are educational or training and I'm basically just showing screen shares and it's my voice with screen shares, I always do the screen shares 
And then I go back and voice over the top of it. So then I don't have to think about what I'm saying when I'm trying to figure out what I'm doing technology wise. So those are the kind of tips and tricks that I teach in my class as well. Yeah. I don't ever, uh, I've done it a couple of times to try to see if I can do it and I've done it, but it didn't work great when I'm actually doing a, a screen share um, type of educational video. I don't ever put the voice on you uh, until after I've recorded the actual screen share. And then, and then you can, you know, if you didn't, you know, and then you obviously have to like stay longer on each frame and, you know, you got to move your mouth slow. I, I teach a lot of that kind of stuff in my class, you know, yeah, to that's amazing. think, that's think about that just makes it easier because if you just click through it, nobody can see where you're, what you're doing. And you have to like make real deliberate moves so that people can see where the mouth is and then they see where you clicked and stuff like that. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's a very valid point because, and we talked a bit about this too, we're so used to doing it. Sometimes we forget what it's like to be new. And so we just assume, well, yeah, of course you do it that way. Yeah. But the person learning is going, what? <laughs> right. Because yeah. you missed something in between. And that's why, again, the more skilled you are and the more you practice teaching, the more you start recognizing how people learn, what people need, what to talk about, how yeah. to structure it, start to yep. finish, so that it, it's concise, it's digestible, it's you know easy for their yep. brain to to maneuver. Yep. Um, because sometimes you'll lose people if yep. you don't consider those things. Absolutely, and that's why you know speaking the difference when you're doing your videos. You can have a script there and notes and everything you want because nobody sees any of that. They're not, yeah. you're just, you know, okay, I need to say these things in the video and now let's go do it. But when you're doing live, usually either in person or live on the network, I, I usually will use PowerPoint slides and, and I don't use PowerPoints to read them. You never want to read a PowerPoint slide. If you do that, you will lose your audience immediately. Yeah. But just having those bullet points on the screen reminds you what you want to talk about. Yes. So. You don't really ever talk to the PowerPoint. When I first started teaching, I would always talk to the PowerPoint. I'd be like, okay here, and okay here, and okay here. And I would talk about it, and sometimes even read the slide. But as I got realized that as soon as you start reading a slide or pointing on a slide, people just turn off. Yeah. Just, that's part of the psychology, they're just gone. But if you go out there and the slide comes up, but you don't really present it in the way the slide said it, you just use the slide basically for you, not the students. And so you gotta look at it and you start talking and you click the next side, you look at it and you start talking, right? And it's, yeah. so those are the kind of tricks that you need to learn to keep your audience engaged, but also keep your mind engaged because you got a lot to do. If you're doing the live on the network, you gotta run the technology. If you're live in person, you gotta work the room as well as. You don't wanna just stand there. I, you know, I, when I teach in person, I'm all over the place. I'm like, you know, I bounce off the walls. I go everywhere, I'm walking through the audience. And uh, I used to, I teach technology most of the time up until this last year. And uh, I would carry uh, either a water gun, like a super soaker, or I would carry an aluminum ball. And as soon as someone fell asleep, I would either shoot them or throw an aluminum balls at them. I was always doing something to surprise people. I had one guy in a class, we're in a class, and he totally just fell asleep out cold, head on the table, snoring. And, uh, and uh, so we're all laughing, right? And we don't, I'm just stopped, you know, I'm just like, okay. And, uh, and it was close to lunchtime, so I said, and we got all real quiet, and at one at a time, I made everybody leave so that no one made a noise. We all emptied the room, shut off the lights, and left them under lunch, <laughs> and left them there. It was the greatest thing, and he woke up in the middle of it and freaked out. He's like, oh, my God. Well, <laughs> yeah, what time is that? <laughs> yeah, so he thought it was like five in the afternoon or something. And then I had another one, and this talk about controlling your audience. Uh, and having you know to do more than just the teaching, right? You're doing more than teaching. I had one class, I, I can remember it like it was yesterday, and this was like 2005. Um, I'm in a room with about 100 people and uh, it's a conference room in a hotel and they actually stacked it so the people were kind of, you know, in a, in a, in a uh, college setting kind of thing where the, each level was a little higher so they could see everything. And, you know, I greeted everybody at the door when they came in. I knew everybody when they came in. I asked questions, find out what they wanted about the class. You know, they got to know me pretty well before the class even started. And then the class started. And within five minutes, the guy in the front, and I always tell people, I say, you know what? We all have lives. We're all engineers. We're all salespeople. We all have clients. If you got a phone call, you know, pick it up quick so it doesn't ring in the room or keep it silenced. 
walk out of the room and take the call out of the room. I don't care. That doesn't disturb me. Don't don't answer the calls in the room. So this guy, 20 minutes in the class, answers the call, front row, right in front of me, answers the call and starts talking to the dude and talking and talking. So I just stopped talking. I stand in front of him. And he's like, you know, he's just like, and uh, um, and he, five minutes later, he finishes his call. And the whole you could just see the whole room like, what the hell, you know? And, uh, and I'm like, dude, you know, that was kind of rude. You shouldn't, you know. Next time, can you please take it outside? He goes, yeah, 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 yeah. About an hour later, a phone call comes in, takes it again right there in the front, so I stop. And I start tapping my toe, and I'm doing this, you know, standing in front of him, and he realizes that I've stopped the whole class for him. And uh, and everybody else is starting to get a little pissed, you could tell. And he talks for like five minutes again. And I said, dude, that really is not cool. You got to take that outside. And he goes, yeah, yeah. So about an hour later, it happens again. And he picks up, he starts talking. I just grabbed the phone out of his hand, turn, hang up the call, put it in my pocket and said, you'll get it back Friday. <laughs> and like, you're doing that with an adult. That yeah, is as awesome. an adult. So Real. these are the kind of things you have to deal with when you're in class. There yeah. will be distractions. You have to know how to handle that. And as a beginner, I don't expect you to be able to handle that in the beginning. Um, you know, And it's going to happen live on the network and it's going to happen live in the room. It's going to happen everywhere. You're going to get distractions. You're going to get that person that leaves the mute turned on or turned off and, you know, they're talking on the phone or, or the kids are running through or the dog's barking and you got to know, know how to handle that and keep the class going, you know, yeah. and just deal with it. Keep it going. And yeah. same in person. Like I did, I took the guy's phone and told him, dude, you're not going to get the phone back till Friday. Sorry. So Speaking dog barking. Yeah. That's funny. Good. Well, I, I, I plan that. <laughs> yeah. He's like, I'll show them. So, and speaking of that, I've done live classes a lot at Cisco in person, and I've done live classes a lot streaming at through the Cisco, right? And I've always had moderators to help me do the, you know, the live class. So they're running the technology. I'm just the teacher, right? So as we talked about before the class, and you wanted me to mention this, I have a lot of prospective students that are coming to me and they want to start their own businesses and they want to get out of their day job and they, or they've lost their day job to COVID, whatever it is that happened. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, um, so they come to me, but the problem is, is their personal finances are just completely in the dumps, right? They, they're yeah. completely out of control. They have no clue where they are. They have debt that's thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars. They don't, and so there's no way they could focus on a business and be creative on a business with so much stress in the home life. And, you know, and I've spent a lot of years helping people get out of debt because I used to be in a lot of debt and I had to figure out how to get myself out of debt. And I kept getting myself out and then back in and back out and back in and back out and back in. And so finally I had to go, you know what? Okay, what's really going on here? I need to fix my relationship with money. You know, yeah, yeah. and uh, once I fixed the relationship with money, the next time I got myself out of debt, I stayed out of debt. And now for the first time in my life, I have savings. It's like, wow, what's this? I can actually, I actually have 17 months of savings and savings that I could live for 17 months right now without, without a job. So that's never happened until now. Um, so, and I've, I've helped a lot of people get out of debt. So I've decided, I kind of had this epiphany and the epiphany was, you know what? Let's play the long game here. And why don't I help a bunch of people get out of debt? Let's go ahead and build a course because that's what I do best, right? I build courses. That's my, that's my superpower. So why don't I build a course to teach people how to get out of debt? Because getting out of debt is easy. Okay, yeah. you're like, Paul, really? It's not easy. No, it really is easy. It's technical. And anything technical has steps, right? Yeah. You do step one, you do step two, you do step three, you do step four, and, and you get out of debt. Yeah. But like I, I said, it's the relationship with money. Yeah. It's that the emotional the attachment, yeah. the vulnerability yeah. that people feel with any talk about money. And all yep. of a sudden we get uncomfortable, and which is also part of those limiting beliefs and those problems yep. with our relationship with money. Yep. And our relationships at home too, you know, with, with our spouses or partners or whatever. Um, so you're probably asking, okay, so Paul, how are you getting on this new subject? <laughs> so where I'm going with this is, I have a lot of students that are in very dire straits and they're in denial and all kinds of stuff about their finances. There's no way they could start a business. And, um, and even if they could start a business for free, which you can pretty much 
start an online course business for almost free. I mean, it's yeah. pretty cheap, but if you're so stressed out, you'll never be able to get it done creatively. So what I've decided to do is I'm going to do my first live workshop and it's going to be a low ticket item. So, and I've never done a, a by myself without moderators and everything, a workshop and it's going to be live in person. I will be recording it so I can take the recordings and make it an on-demand course after I'm done, but I'm not going to spend two months building a course and then just start selling it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to sell a low ticket course on, and it's going to be called financially fit workshop. And I'm hoping to do it the first one in late July. We'll see. It might be sometime in August. Um, but in the next six weeks, I'm going to try to have the first class and I'm going to make it a low ticket. I'm probably going to come out at like 50 bucks to get in. If you don't pay anything, if I make it free, people don't value it and they won't do it and they won't participate. So My I'm going to put a small fee on it. Yep. People pay attention when they yep. pay. Yep. And, and although they're having problems with money, they're still, if it's free, they're not going to do it. And I'm, and I'm giving away hints here. I'm giving away tips, things that I teach in my course, right? Yeah. I mean, in my big course, because I'm giving away free stuff right now, because yeah. these are tips that you really need to know. You, you know, people will not value it. And people don't really start really valuing a class until it hits about the thousand dollar mark. People really don't see a class. I, when I sell my classes at 500, half the people will never do the class. They'll never even open it. And it's like, just because they don't value $500. It's around a thousand when I start seeing the number of people that actually do the course go considerably high at about a thousand bucks. But I'm gonna make this one live in person and make it an emotional thing. I'm gonna basically, here's what you're going to get out of it. You know, let's not just give you the steps to get out of debt, which we will work on during the five days, but let's work on that relationship. And I might even I'm thinking about even adding meditation into the workshop. So we're gonna we're gonna meditate on it. We're gonna get into some meditation and actually do some meditations each day in each one of the classes to think about. So we take some time to think about why I'm in debt and what I can do to change or what makes um, me get to debt. Yeah. So I'm going to put some meditations that relationship together. With money. Yeah, gonna, I had to deal. I mean, I deal with this in my course as well is, is getting people to really think about their relationship to money. And yeah. Sometimes we have to break that relationship. We have to end Absolutely. it, and start a new one. Yep. And, and we have to understand and go deep because some of those limiting beliefs yep. are so deeply rooted, like yep. almost ancestral to some degree. Yeah. That we have to go, I'm carrying my great grandfather's <laughs> limiting yeah. belief yeah. on me. Yeah. Right? That's Absolutely. That Absolutely. And I usually start out, and I'm probably going to start out with day one with needs and desires, right? What do I need and what do I want? You know, I'm going to start out there um, with my relationship training because that seems to be one of the biggest ones is, you know, I really want that. I'm just going to buy it. You know, I don't care to pay the car bill. I'm going to go buy that, you know, TV or whatever, you know, and that, 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 you know, I'm a minimalist, so I don't like having stuff in my house. The less stuff I have in my house, the more happy I am. So yeah. I don't have a lot of things, you know, and, uh, and every time I go to buy anything, I'm like, okay, one, do I need this? And two, is it going to add clutter to my house? And am I going to have to pick it up to dust underneath it? If I have to dust underneath it, I'm not going to buy it. Period. And uh, so that, that, that does it for me. That's my trigger, right? If I think I'm going to have to dust it or dust under it, I won't buy it. <laughs> so, so anyways, I'm, I'm look, I'm getting psyched up right now and I'm building the outline of the course and getting everything ready. I'm going to have some PDFs to hand out some worksheets. I actually just built a super cool spreadsheet. That's going to be the work the work uh, base for all the work we're going to do all week. So I created it in Google so I can share it. And uh, so I have this really super cool sheet that's going to take care of all the, the financial part of it. And now I'm putting together all the stuff. So I'm getting myself psyched up to do my first live by myself on the internet course. And like I said, that'll become the on-demand course. Probably, yeah. probably the second time I run it, I'll probably bump it up to $100 each um, instead of 50. I'll start the first one at 50. And probably the on-demand will probably be somewhere around 250. And that's part of what we teach in my big classes. How do you figure out what to charge people? And yeah. imposter syndrome usually what decides, you know, what you're going to charge, right? Yeah. Um, Again, and that stems from that relationship yeah. with money and how, what we think yes. we're worth. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and so you have to build that self-esteem up. If you have a low self-esteem, you're going to charge a low price. I had one lady. Oh, I can't believe this. I had one, one of my students. She basically teaches real estate agents how to dress for the job. That's her, that's her, 
her what she does. And she does a great job at it. And she teaches them how to do it with the clothes they already have. Um, so that's awesome. She she had been doing onesie twosies the whole time, and she just finally got a whole real estate company and say, you know what, we're gonna buy this for all of our agents. And it was like 120 agents. And uh, and that's about when she came to me and she goes, well, you know, let me ask you, I, I got this chance to put a bid in to do this for this 120 real estate agents. And because of COVID, we're doing it all through Zoom. So they basically, she takes a Zoom tour of their closet and their dressers instead of going live in person. But normally she goes to the person's house and uh, which keeps her local, which means, you know, she can't make as much money. But she was going to do all 120 people for 3,000 bucks. And I was like, so you're going to do an hour minimum with each person and you're going to charge 3,000 bucks. And I, and I figured it out. It was like $1.50 an hour, something like that, just, to, just based on an hour per person. I said, you really want to, you know, you're really worth $1.50 an hour? She goes, what do you mean? I said, well, you told me X number of hours, right? 120 people, that's 120 hours minimum. Yeah. And, uh, you know, divide that by 3,000. What do you get? And she, she did it. She goes, oh my God. You know, I didn't even think of it that way. I just thought 3,000 was a lot. And I did numbers. I did a bunch of math and she was freaking out on what math I was doing. And I said, if I was you, I would charge $56,487.55. And she about blew a lid. She goes, no, no way I can ask for that amount of money. And, uh, and I said, do it. It's only $450 a person. Yeah. And that's nothing to teach someone how to dress and, you know, to yeah. be professional at work. Yeah. And so she wrote up the proposal. She hesitated for a week and a half. No, I can't send this. No, I can't send it. I said, send it. They signed it that day without hesitation. Wow. Yeah, it, you know what? It's true. And, and I was sort of in that place when I was, um, I was pricing a, a whole day seminar conference that I have for teachers on vocal health and, you know, engaging in the classroom. Because having been a teacher, I worked with so many educators with vocal damage because they don't know how to talk properly and they're constantly talking over 30 kids. And, um, you know, so. That's when, when a paddle would, comes in handy. <laughs> <laughs> You're dating yourself. <laughs> oh, man, you don't know how many paddlings I took in school, man. It was every oh, week, no. every week. I, I, was, I always thought it was something that they threatened us with, but didn't really exist because you no, never really knew anybody who got it. Yeah. The oh, stuff. I was, you always heard it in our school because they would do it in the hall, right? And there had to be another teacher to witness it. And uh, so there's always two teachers and you in the hall. You put your hands on the wall and they freaking burn your butt up. It was, it was, and I was the class clown. I was always trying to get people to laugh and have fun. So and I was like, always in the hall getting paddled, always. Oh my gosh. It was a weekly occurrence for me. Yeah, that, that, wow. That's, I have a hard time. <laughs> so anyways, I'm sorry, over. Having I, been a teacher, I have a really hard time digesting that. Yeah, it because was. Because I can't imagine. Anyway. Yeah, it, you, um, you definitely wanted to get paddled by the women teachers than the, than the guy teachers, because the guy teachers were usually the, the football coach, and they were like yeah. monsters. Yeah. And it hurt when they did it. Oh my God, they'd light you up. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh, that, that hurts my heart. Um, <laughs> anyway, back to the, the course that I but, created. I created the, the course and I wanted to do it as a professional development for teachers. And when I sort of presented it to some of my other teacher friends, they were like, <laughs> <"We're>, <laughs> that much? But I'm like, I was I, like, I charged two hundred fifty dollars a person for a full day seminar. And I'm thinking I would totally pay that, and I have paid that as a teacher to go to to seminars before. Yeah. And I'm thinking that's not a lot when you present it to a board, and it's for like a hundred teachers. Yeah, it's twenty five thousand yeah. dollars. But. It's a full day. It's and it's a preventative reparatory seminar that teaches teachers how to do their job so that they don't physically lose their voice Absolutely. and possibly have permanent damage as a result. Absolutely. Uh, so it was like it's funny how people 
people's mentality around that in my head, I'm like $250 a person is a steal for them yeah. getting all day with me. And I don't know that I would have done it for less than a thousand a person, to be honest with you. Well, and that's the thing. And I, I, I'm thinking because school boards don't have a, I mean, they have money, but they don't, right? Yeah. I, if it was a different industry, I might charge more, but because it's a school system and I understand the provision of, or lack of funds they have, I feel okay charging 250, 250 yeah. a person. But it's amazing how many say no to it yep. when I absolutely. know their teachers are suffering. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. And you, you could take that kind of course to professional speaker type training as well, right? Yeah. I mean, that would be a good I do, one. I do a lot of one-on-one -on -one professional yeah. speaking coaching, but yeah, it most definitely is, right? And that's, I do talk about it. People don't want to, not, not, I shouldn't generalize, but um, I find people are like, oh yeah, 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 my voice is healthy. I'm like, is that? Like yeah. I, Tony Robbins will be my student. Yeah. He will be a client of mine. That's my goal. Absolutely. And I've actually talked to a friend of his um, about it. And she's like, yeah, he does need you. <laughs> right. <laughs> Cause he's had, he's had yeah. coaches in the past and they clearly haven't worked. Yeah. Whereas I do more than just vocal coaching. I do a lot of the psychology of tension and what's happening here as well, yeah. because it can yeah. go way deeper than just how we use our voice. And so I'm like, <laughs> I'm dying to get my hands on him because I know he needs it. But it's amazing how many people are like, oh, no, no, I can talk. I'm fine. Well, you can also, it's, it's not only just keeping your voice safe. It's also how to engage your, your students, right? I mean, yeah. when I talk a little bit softer, they have to lean in a little bit. Yes. And that's and, you know, and when I, when I, I then once they're really in, you go really big, they're like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. And it keeps them awake. And it also keeps them excited and engaged. And. And I use those tricks all the time when I'm talking, without even really thinking about it anymore. It just kind of happens when I'm getting ready to accentuate a joke or something, I'll usually go a little softer and they have to, you know, come in at you a little bit. And, you, yeah. and that's one of the reasons why I like live, pro, you know, yes. presenting because it's more fun to play with people like that, right? Yeah, absolutely. So. And, and that's exactly what I teach. I love hearing you say that because I'm like, yeah, that's what I teach people um, because they don't understand there is truly an art to engaging any audience. It doesn't matter their age. It doesn't matter who they are. Yep. What matters is you keep them listening. You keep them on the edge of what you're doing um, because obviously they're there for a reason. They're learning whatever they need to learn, but it's your responsibility as the speaker, as the teacher to make the information palatable. Absolutely. Absolutely. I agree with you hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah, we are on the same sure. wavelength. That so, excites uh, me. So anyways, I'm really excited actually to try to do this live in person uh, workshop. It's going to be a lot of fun. And I think we'll have a lot of uh, a lot of good results. And hopefully if we can get a bunch of people in there that will, you know, because like I said, I've watched people come out of debt that I've helped and help them change the relationship. And it's just a, you know, a crying type of moment, right? It's very yeah. emotional. And there's and, a freedom in it. Yeah. Right, because you almost feel like there's a monkey on your back when when you've got debt and you don't you can't see that light through the forest. Yeah, it just feels like it's swallowing you up. So when when you take that off, and yep. you're like, I can breathe, and I and you can be creative, and yeah. you can be creative to build your business, and and just so people realize. I'm not just trying to make a whole be in uh, in a whole other industry. I'm good at getting people out of debt. I'm good at building courses. Yeah. I'm kind of playing a long game here by let me help a bunch of people get out of debt that want. So it's going to be geared towards. I'm going to market towards aspiring entrepreneurs that want to get out of debt so they can be more creative to build their online course and coaching program. Yeah. So I'm hoping that you know if I can get a bunch of people in there on a low ticket, get them out of debt, get them you know in a much better place mentally they'll get to know me. They'll say, you know what? He really taught me well on this course. Let me go take his high ticket course and, uh, and learn how to build courses and, and take the next step and actually build a business. And, and, you know, I love passive and residual income. That's my favorite. So um, anytime I don't have to give time for money, I'm, I'm in love. 
that well and this, this is something that this could be a whole other episode we could do a whole another hour on that yeah exactly is it, talking about creating different streams of income and yeah. as an entrepreneur it's smart it's a smart way to Absolutely. do it and that's why so many they write books they put out different materials they have you know yes. content based on that they invest, they do all things so that they have these different streams. So you're Absolutely. not relying solely on one because what happens something like a pandemic yep. and perhaps one stream of income is taken from you because all of yep. a sudden you can't do something. Then what do you do? Right. That well, was the story that was happening. Perfect example. 20 November, 2019 not because I was trying to, I started a digital agency and I build a lot of websites for people. I do that as well. And, uh, and I also was doing, um, review management for, you know, I knew how to do review management and list management for local companies. And I got a bunch of people all of a sudden that just hit me and said, Hey, will you build our website? Hey, will you take care of all our reviews? Will you take care of a listing? And so from November 19 until March of 20, Without even trying, I built a ten thousand dollar a month business, just like that. It was just like overnight, and uh, and I think I was roughly at around fifteen thousand a month. And I was like, you know what? This is the first time I think I can probably leave Cisco. This is going to be great. And luckily, I didn't, because March twenty hit and pandemic hit. All my businesses were local businesses here in Raleigh, North Carolina. Yeah. All of them, every single one of them, were shut down. So immediately, I went from fifteen thousand a month to zero. Just like that. And uh, um, so my one stream of income that I was getting ready to think about leaving Cisco on was gone, just like that. So here I am in 21, still working for Cisco, but it's looking pretty good. Maybe this year I'll do it because I'm building a much more stable um, streams of income. I've got, you know, my digital course warriors that's doing fairly decent. And I've got, uh, you know, investing that I've got going on. I'm out of debt. And I've got, like I said, 17 months of savings and and I'm, I'm looking at going full-time RV for my first phase of this uh, digital uh, or uh, becoming a digital nomad is actually okay. going out and doing, spend a year in an RV, just tooling around America. And, oh, I uh, love it. That's a great abroad. idea. Yeah. And then, and then from there, I'll probably buy a sailboat and base out of the keys and live on a sailboat and hit the islands and stuff. Cause I used to do a lot of sailing. So that's so, also a great idea. Yeah. I'm going with the idea of moving to the Caribbean. So yeah, me too. I, I've been looking at the Virgin islands a lot lately yeah. so yeah. and okay. turks and caicos but that's kind of gotten over overrated already it's a little expensive yeah. at turks and caicos there was a time i uh, probably a decade ago when canada almost bought turks and caicos yeah. and I was like please please because then i'm just taking my passport and i'm moving to turks yeah. and caicos yeah. so i mean that didn't happen unfortunately but i'm like I can work anywhere as long as yeah. i have wi-fi and yeah, i'm too. capable of doing that now so Yep. why don't I? And so yeah. that's why I'm like, yeah, I'm going to go to a beach and yep. I'm going to- The, only, the yeah. only reason I stuck around Raleigh so long is because I had kids shared with another person. So I had to wait here until kids were gone. Now the kids are gone. And I told my, I've been telling my kids for years because I pretty much raised them myself. Um, I've been telling them for years. I'm like, just know that when you turn 18, when the youngest one is 18, there's not going to be a house to come back to. So you need to make sure that you're stable and steady and ready to go. And you have your life planned and prepared because you're more than welcome to come visit me wherever I am when you have breaks, like, like summer break or whatever. But, you know, so you can meet me wherever I am in the RV and I fly into town and hey, there's not going to be a house. Yeah. And it turns out the first summer there was a house, but um, <laughs> I'm, I'm looking at RVs. I'm this close to, to pulling the trigger on one. So. I love it. it. It's about living your best life, right? Absolutely. Life is too short not to. It's way too short. Way yeah. too short. I, 30 I'm years went by like that in my career. And, you know, all I did was bust my butt for someone else for 30 years. Yeah. And I don't, do don't really, I mean, yeah. I have a great career and I know a lot of people that know me and love me at Cisco and stuff, but really didn't, doesn't do much for me. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it, you've got, well, I always say too, that sometimes it was good for a time, but your priorities change. And I think yep. COVID showed us that. 
right? We had yeah. to stop and actually look at our lives and reevaluate. And, and it really made us think about what is truly important and how we Absolutely. move forward. Absolutely. So uh, I was planning this before, just so you know, I was planning all this before COVID. So it wasn't COVID that made me change my mind. I was just waiting for empty. I was just waiting for empty nest. <laughs> waiting for the kids to get out just, of the house. Yeah, just, I, it just so happens that empty nest happened during a pandemic. <laughs> right. Yes, exactly. Yeah. But I, I honestly believe, I mean, there's there's a silver lining to every dark cloud. And, and I think, yeah, this pandemic was uh, like anything we've ever seen. Hugo. Um, but the silver lining is it made us communicate differently. Yep. It made us connect in a different way so that we Absolutely. weren't isolated. And it made us reevaluate our lives because we realized and recognized anything can happen. Anything. So do it, do life the way you want to do life. Be happy. Well, I mean, look at that hockey player last week. I forget which team he's on. Sitting in a hot tub last week, minding his own business. And they were, they were shooting fireworks off beside, you know, home fireworks. One of them fell to the right and the shell hit him and he's dead. <laughs> 24, he's dead. I have so, I hear that. Oh my gosh. And, and look at the people in that uh, Miami disaster, the building fell and you're just sleeping oh in your bed God. one night and you're dead, right? So, yeah. Um, so you just never know. So you got to live the best life you can and enjoy it. And, you know, I've had a great life. I've had a lot of fun. I've been a lot of places. I've done a lot of stuff. I, I, I'm way more fortunate than most people. I'm, you know, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, you know, doing, you know, I had a great life and yeah. I, you know, I still have hopefully another 50 years that, uh, that, you know, I'll make it even better, so. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for being in the hot seat. This has been fabulous. I'm so glad we were able to to maneuver it the way we did and, and Absolutely. were able to, to come on. And I look forward to seeing how things evolve with, with this new, you know, venture, this live workshop that you're doing. So keep me yeah. posted, keep us Yeah, posted. and I'm also planning a live five-day workshop on building courses as well. Yeah, but, exactly. and that'll be a, a low ticket as well to bring people in. Yeah. But, but I'm getting ready to do that as well, but I'm going to wait till after the financial one to do that one. Amazing. Amazing. Well, keep me posted because I certainly have clients that I can I'm recommend it to I will let you. and wanting to do that as well. So thank you. This has been a great, uh, a great pleasure and a great honor. Thank you. Well, thank you. Enjoy and uh, have fun being an empty nester. <laughs> Oh, I'm loving. I'm having a great time. It's the best. <laughs> I, I love my kids. Love my kids to death. They're the greatest people. But you know what? This next phase is awesome. I'm loving it. Single and empty nest. You don't. You can't beat that. <laughs> exactly. There you go. Uh, right. It's almost like bachelorhood all over. Again. Oh, it is. My, it's funny because I got rid of pretty much everything. Getting ready for empty nest. So in my bedroom, there's just a bed like college, and there's no dresser, nothing, just a bed. And and the couch is an old day bed that was my daughter's bed when she was five. You know, it's, it's like college all over again. So yeah. but I'm trying to get rid of everything to get ready for RV life, right? So yep. that's so. funny. I'm doing the same thing. I'm purging to get ready. Cause I'm like, I am moving to the Caribbean. I don't care. Caribbean yep. or bust. Yeah. Well, keep, let's, uh, let's talk in the background about it. Cause I'm in the same kind of thought trend mind. Maybe we can help each other out on some research and stuff. Yeah. Amazing. I love Absolutely. it. Absolutely. All right. All thank right. you so much. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Have a great day. <laughs>